For the people, by the people. News first, news line with Faraz Shaukatali. And very good evening to you and a warm welcome to Newsline Live. I'm delighted to have as our guest today uh, an old friend of the network, um, always a friend of the network, and the former cabinet minister of plantation. So. Uh, we can ask him a few insightful questions. I'm sure he'll be able to give us the answers. None other than, all the way from Nureli, I suppose, uh, Mr. Naveen Disanaka. Very good evening to you, Naveen Disanaka. Wonderful to have you on the program. Thank you so much for us for having me again. Really enjoy your show, and I hope to have a very meaningful and uh, nice and in-depth conversation with you. Thank you. Uh, straight away, uh, Mr. Disanaka, especially because you know you were uh, one time the cabinet minister of plantation. So. You know, currently, why can't we buy petrol, gas, medicines, diesel, fertilizer, and a whole host of other things? But why? Why can't we buy them? <coughs> well, I think it's a very simple explanation. It's that the uh, country has a huge foreign currency problem, mm. and uh, you have to buy uh, these uh, essential goods on an imported basis. Yeah. Few of them are uh, homemade, but uh, we have a currency problem. We don't have dollars. So, so without, without dollars, <coughs> you can't open LCs, yeah. and uh, without LCs, nobody will ship goods to you. Mm. So <coughs> unless, uh, unless and until the government with Mr. Vikram Singh as finance, Minister of Finance mm. arranges uh, favorable financial terms to Sri Lanka in terms of dollars, uh, we won't be able to get over this problem. So, so it, it is a historic problem, mm. and uh, I can tell you frankly that uh, uh, it is, I think, more acute uh, than uh, 2007, when uh, a few of us in the UNP, 17 of us, helped Mahindra Rajapaksa to overcome that uh, war situation. Mm. This is an economic war, <coughs> and uh, the, sink the ship is sinking very fast. Uh, the water is uh, coming into the ship. Mm. Uh, there are lots of holes in the ship. Uh, we have to somehow bridge the holes, mm. ensure that the water is curtailed, and uh, make sure that the, uh, the ship is not uh, sunk. Right. So, so for that, uh, for us, I think all Sri Lankans, uh, regardless of race, religion, or party politics, should get together and then work towards a common cause. So After that, we can do politics. So, uh, so the common cause then, obviously, is to look for uh, foreign exchange, to look for dollars. How, what's what's the solution? What's the immediate game plan? Yeah, so so the patient is bleeding, mm. and uh, patient needs oxygen. Mm. So we need to uh, give the oxygen and stop the bleeding. Right. Number one. So then after that comes the long term, middle term, and the long term reforms of the economy, yeah. which is also going to be very painful, mm. because um, as you know, you have uh, spoken to very eminent uh, people like Pakistani Sarun Muktu on the program. Um, you know, you have spoken to academics, uh, you're a very informed person, you're a very, very uh, investigative journalist who has got a very good reputation. So essentially, uh, we have been living beyond our means, Sri Lankan and Sri Lankans. Indeed. But, you know, talking about the solutions, and uh, we obviously have to acknowledge uh, that Rani Wickram is singer, uh, <coughs> several things notwithstanding, certainly uh, must be held up because he rose to the challenge and he put himself forward and uh, he's there and he's, uh, uh, you know, he's, he's, uh, he's doing what he can. Now then, do you believe in your observations as a veteran seasoned politician, do you believe that Mr. Vikram Singh has got a strategy, and I don't mean his strategy of borrowing from friends, because there's a limit to how much you can borrow from friends. What about his strategy for earning dollars, our dollars then? Yeah, well, exports are the key. Uh, 
Mm. And I was the Minister of Plantation Industries. So as you know, you were having a long dialogue with uh, my friend Hemakumar Nanakar yesterday. Yes. And uh, you got a um, you got a feel of what the plantation sector is, uh, what the situation is basically crashing. So Mr. Vikramasinghe needs to show up the uh, the exports, uh, especially this plantation sector, which brings about 3.5 billion USD a year. Mm. So the fertilizer issue, the weedicide issue, all that comes into play. But f really, for us, at the end of the day, for a country with a 74-year history, mm. uh, never come to a situation like this in my life. Uh, and I'm, I'm in my 50s now. Mm. So you're in your 60s. Mm. Uh, <coughs> so at the end of the day, uh, even in the 70s, Mrs. B's time, we never, with Dr. Nemperer as the, as the Minister of Finance, we never had a uh, USD problem. <coughs> now with the open economy, <coughs> Um, essentially, from 7.5 billion USD when we left the government in 2019, you go and bust up 4.5 billion on shoring up your rupee at 203. Mm. So you spend 4.5 billion, more than half of your foreign reserves on that. Mm. And then uh, you go and reduce your tax from uh, a tax base of 600 billion from that, bring it from 15 to 8 percent. So I, I think this is a huge was the recipe for disaster. Huge negligence. Mm. Uh, I would I don't I can't go far as saying criminal negligence, mm. but it's, uh, certainly for public servants and politicians who, who took that decision. I mean the people of this country they are basically are on the streets, uh, basically on the streets because of that. Are you firmly of the view that the one of the major problems that we are facing today is because of this so-called ill thought out giveaway in terms of those taxes well this is the mentality of uh, politicians that have been built up mm. and uh, I am for us uh, firmly of the view that as a right of center politician that uh, you know you can't curtail the market mm. and uh, the market economics must be given its due place mm. so when you have from I'm not you know of course uh, Mahindra Rajapaksa and his family is to blame for a lot of this mm. but from 1994 it has been more of a uh, left of center government mm. from Chandrika's time, mm. where the free free goodies are given all the time. Now, mm. when, when Chandrika came to power, bread was given at 350. I don't know, you were not in Sri Lanka at that time, no. but I was. Mm. So, <coughs> every time it's the ow, the ow, the ow, the ender, the ender, the ender. So, you can't do that. There's no free lunches anymore. <coughs> so, so now when we are going into a IMF program, yeah. we have to take stock of the situation, and the IMF will give, we have to give our program. Of of, you know, of 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 curtailing expenditure, yeah. and then the IMF will work around that, and we have to accept that program and go forward. Because they they'll also be interested in knowing how we're going to service our, our existing debt. Yes. So so when you talk about existing debt, we have to pay the five billion that is there for this year, and then you need another five billion to so bring in the essentials. The so, so, so so there are there are there are. I mean, uh, as a person who's in the know and uh, who knows a bit about finance because I've got a master's in finance from the University of London. Mm. There are options available for Sri Lanka, uh, but Sri Lanka has to be very practical. Mm. There are international uh, financial agencies that are willing to give Sri Lanka money, mm. but then, uh, you know, the central bank has to be a bit more flexible on... What, what's holding them back? Is it a sort of a deficit, a confidence deficit, a trust deficit? No, in it's the, the thinking of... It's, no, it's, a, uh, it's the extreme conservative thinking of the 60s. Mm. That is, uh, if you, you know, you the categories of money that are there. <coughs> you have M0, M1 which is basically money from institutions and governments. Mm. Then you have M2 and M3, which is in saving deposits in European banks. Mm. So <coughs> those funds are available uh, at a certain risk. Mm. So the country has to decide politically yeah. whether they want to take those funds or not. IMF might say, you know, be cautious. But those options are there. I mean, equ equity finance is available at a cost. Right. But uh, Sri Lanka has to decide uh, whether you are going to die uh, without these funds or whether you are going to you know take another breath with these funds and and play play the long game mm -hmm. so I, I feel with uh, mr. Vikramasinghe there uh, or even 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 uh, you know even even a professional finance minister like Harsha that uh, we can get over this problem provided 
provided that there is consensus mm -hmm. in political thinking, in, in political leaders, mm -hmm. that, uh, that we have to work together and overcome this crisis without playing uh, politics at this time. But, uh, uh, <coughs> uh, Navin Sana, could, uh, tell me, you know, your constituency is Norelia, and um, I suppose it's uh, part of the heart of uh, agricultural land. Yes. How do you explain to your uh, constituents the statement that uh, the Prime Minister said earlier uh, today, you know, uh, when he was talking about the not having a referendum and, and not putting it towards a referendum and all that. And he also said, you know, he's not only the Prime Minister, but he's also the firefighter and he needs to find $40 million every, every day, I think he said, you know, which is a lot of money. But he also said something that is uh, going to be, I'm sure, is going to hit the news tomorrow, uh, uh, if not already. And that is, he said that there will come a time when Sri Lankans will have two meals a day instead of three. That's like dynamite. Mm -hmm. But Mr. Wickramasinghe has a way of saying uh, what he has to say, which is good, because all this time we've been living in denial. Yeah. But how, well, how are you going to take that message to your constituents out there in Norelia? Well, honestly, uh, Faraz, and frankly speaking, our people are uh, Mr. Vikramasinghe doesn't have to say that. Already, already, already uh, people are, uh, you know, from three to two meals now. Um, maybe the upper middle class and the middle class is just kind of going on three meals, but curtail three meals. Mm. But in my constituents in, of Norelia, where the plantation workers are, they are basically skin and bones now. So, so uh, maybe <laughs> maybe that has to be amended to my constitution. My constituent has said two meals to becoming one meal a day. It's that bad because uh, the plantation workers, uh, which constitute 60% of my district, um, are just getting 1,000 rupees a day. Mm. And most of them, because of this stupid, utterly stupid move that was done by this government to, uh, ban, to ban uh, uh, chemical fertilizer, mm. plantation companies have been hit. And they are not even plucking the norm of 18 kilos a day. So unless you hit the norm, you're not going to get anything more than 1,000 rupees. And some of these uh, uh, farmers, uh, these workers, uh, they, they sort of supplemented their tea plucking thing by working on farms. But yeah. now I'm told that even those farms don't have uh, the kind of production uh, to employ these uh, extra people even on a part-time basis. Well, Faraz, I can tell you honestly that I, as the Minister of Plantation Industries, and I'm very proud that I did this when Maitri Pawar Sirisena bought this uh, again silly policy of banning weedicide. Um, uh, and I must say Mr. Raja Mahendran also backed me. Mm. Um, I stood up and I said this is one of the most silliest decisions that I ever come across. And then Mr. Gotabe Rajapaksa went ahead and did this chemical ban, mm. chemical fertilizer ban, which I think yesterday Hema Kumara said yeah. from thir thir between 30 to 60 percent production drop. Yeah. So you can imagine a poor estate worker who has no land at all and who lives on plucking tea uh, and he, he, has to, he has to earn that 18 kilos a day to get that thousand rupees. You can just imagine how the estate workers are suffering now. It's a, it's, I mean, I can't imagine that. The, mm. thing, the people who are watching this show yeah. should understand that for the plantation workers, it's a hands-to-mouth existence every day. In any event. It, in any event, so yeah. now with, with, the, with the chemical fertilizer ban and no production in the tea estates, you can just imagine where the tea industry is going to. It's, it's a pathetic situation. Honestly pathetic. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not trying to uh, overestimate the situation. I, as the plantation minister, can see a, a huge drop in our tea this year. Normally we are easily hitting 300 million kilos. Yeah. This year it will be about 240 to 250. My goodness, but that's going to impact on our foreign exchange earnings. Definitely, but uh, who's responsible for this? Who's, talk, who, who, who's, that's a who's, who's talking about it? That's, that's a question from, uh, from Gintata in Gaul. Hmm. Who is responsible? The people are suffering. Who is responsible? Yeah, well, I, I have to say that, uh, I mean, uh, it's a very sad situation for this country and people have to understand that uh, politicians, uh, whether they, they're in the Pohutur or UNP or whatever, mm. um, they have to collectively uh, answer to the people of this country. 
And I'm very sad to say that because um, I, I, in my life, have never seen a situation like this. But, you know, with <coughs> all this, uh, with the 20th Amendment and so on and so forth, the untrammeled powers of the President of Sri Lanka, can I put it to you that in terms of the suffering of the farmers, the, the messing around with the food security of our country uh, is down simply to one person, and that is the President of Sri Lanka, Gotabi Rajapaksa. I fully, I fully agree with that. The uh, President was uh, misled by, uh, I think, a person, a doctor. Yes. Doctor, I want to mention his name, Dr. Padinia, mm. and uh, a monk who I had a uh, run in all the time. And but but you know there are I just like to mention this uh, for us in the tea industry there's what you call the tea research institute mm. which was set up by the Britishers mm. uh, rubber research institute which is one of the oldest institutes in in Asia and also the coconut coconut research institute so and also we have the uh, what you call the, the rice research institute mm. so before you make a policy decision like this you should at least call the experts. And get and their get their there. opinions about uh, the impact of addition like this. Absolutely, <coughs> which is probably why we have two years and one month. On that note, let's go for a quick break and have a look at this evening's uh, headlines from that wonderful primetime news team. See you on the other side of the break, shall we? News first, newsline with Faraz Shaukatali. Basil acquitted from the Malvana case. <laughs> Lawyers protest. <laughs> Were tokens issued to local government politicians for the purchase of gas? <laughs> Daylight murders. What happened to Mahinda Kahadagama? Will the children in hospital have to starve? <laughs> News First, Newsline with Faraz Shaukutali. Welcome back to Newsline Live. I'm in conversation with Mr. Naveen Desanaika, former uh, cabinet minister of plantations here in Sri Lanka. Now then, the people are facing a food uh, food crisis. Uh, the country is facing, of course, a dollar crisis. But in Parliament, they are talking about a new constitution and so on and so forth, leading uh, to me, uh, leading to this comparison. Uh, this card coming up on your screen right now. The United States Constitution was in since 1789, 233 years. Honestly, do we really need, what do we need? A new constitution or do we need a solution to the people's distress? Well, I think it's, uh, it's a mixed bag. Is it you, intertwined? You, uh, it, it is intertwined. I think the Aragalea boys and girls want a more transparent government, mm. want a more uh, honest government, mm. uh, want a more efficient government. So therefore, there is a feeling that the 19th Amendment should be brought back in terms of the 21st Amendment. Um, there is a famous um, constitutional uh, jurist, I think, called de Tocqueville. Mm. He said that constitution should embed the living spirit of the people. So therefore, <coughs> when I look at this uh, sheet of paper you gave me, mm. I can interpret this in that, in that light. Mm. Now, if you look at the Japanese constitution, mm. 72 years, single, more or less a single party, right. LDP, okay. right? Mm. No, no major policy shifts in that uh, country. Mm. They all had a singular, after the war, singular effort to rebuild the economy, and they are the seventh largest economy in the world now. Mm. Uh, <coughs> South Korea also nine amendments, uh, more or less a single, a single party entity there. Singapore, we know the People's Action Party, yes. never been out of power. Yes. Okay. <laughs> and uh, finally, Sri Lanka, 74 years, three constitutions. You can see from 1948, there was a long gap without any constitution. Mm. 72, Mrs. B bought the Republican constitution. Mm. And then uh, 78, of course, JR's, uh, Mrs. President Jawadana's executive presidency constitution. Mm. Mm. 
uh, and then of course uh, amendments, so many amendments. We had the 13th Amendment which brought in the provincial councils, mm. which at that time, you know, with Rajiv Gandhi, we've signed the accord mm. and there was a devolution of power from 13 to it has come to 20 now. So essentially, when we bought the 19th Amendment, we never expected the Rajapaksas to revert it back mm. and bring uh, basically Basil Rajapaksa to Parliament as a, as a dual citizen to, to come back to Parliament. Mm. The constitution was changed for Basil Rajapaksa to come back, right? So, so that kind of, uh, kind of uh, family-based politics has to stop in Sri Lanka for us because this has gone on for enough, you know, just to bring one man back you you change the entire constitution and two thirds of the parliamentarians they are they raise their hand for that. Mm. So this kind of uh, this kind of absurd, uh, lethargic, uh, ineffective decision making policy making has to change, and that's why finally we we must bring the twenty first amendment so that we must have a sense of good governance and balance in this country. Would you welcome a move to? getting rid of the presidency in total or i am for that i am for that because not because of uh, what the modern uh, political leaders are saying uh, i'm very happy to be the son of a father gamme de sanayaka and a, a man that i really love and respect larita tatmudali they fought against president premadasa they left the unp mm. and their first and single most foremost uh, slogan and they believed it in their heart. You know, Lalit wrote the constitution. Mm. They said the executive presidency has to go out. So I'm in, I'm in total favor of banishing the executive presidency. Because you presidency. believe in that or because it was, uh, your father was part of that? No, Lalit and Gamini, they, they were part of the executive presidency and they saw the ills of it. Mm -hmm. so, so, so Lalit is the one who wrote the constitution with H.W. Jayavardhana. Mm. So they, they felt that this concentration of power it's was too much. Too much. And, and, and basically, we, we in the Yahapalne government, we, when we diluted that uh, for us. And these guys, the Rajapaksas, they went and bloated that again. Mm. So, so where is the country going to go? It's, it's an absurd situation. In, in light of what uh, is uh, popularly sort of believed, that we are now living through the days of the end of South Asia's uh, uh, probably one of the strongest political uh, dynasties, the Rajapaksa dynasty, the end of that. In the view of all that and in the view of this, uh, the, the winds of change that are howling uh, as we speak, especially at Golf Face and so on, do you believe that there is a case for the betterment of our country if the United National Party and the SJB were to fuse back together? Let's put it like this for us. I have been a, a politician and a politician political watcher for a long time. Mm. I won't write off anything in this country, mm. right? Nothing is impermanent. Mm. Much, as much as the Rajapaksas are hated now, uh, 10 years down the line, you never know how the people of this country are going to vote. This, uh, certainly the Rajapaksas have a propensity to bouncing back. Yes. Do you think that's a caveat we must put in place when we're talking about a politics? At the moment, I, I think, uh, as Mr. Vikram Singh himself said, Nobody will vote for Rajapaksa right now, mm. but we never know in the future when Mrs. Bandaranaika uh, lost in 77, we never thought her daughter would come in 1994. So we, we never know what will happen in Sri Lanka and that's the beauty of politics, I think, you know, mm. the, the whole adventure of politics. Mm. Uh, politics is an ebb and flow of uh, feelings of the people. Uh, but, but right now, Sri Lanka is going through a, a, a crisis of confidence. The youth of this country are crying and they're saying, where is our future? You have robbed our future. Uh, we, they are going in mass numbers uh, overseas. The people want to leave the country. Never has a situation like this happened. So I, I think, uh, Mr. and I said that in the working committee also, in the UMP working committee, uh, before these uh, events happened, I said, uh, I told Mr. Vikram Singh, he, he has a huge responsibility. Uh, to uh, steer this country in the right direction. This and, is his sixth time around. Do you think this is the sixth time around? This is redemption time? Well, he has the experience for it. He is he's the most experienced uh, person uh, in parliament to uh, face this and he's known as a person who, who is good at crisis management. So, so like uh, Hema Kumar also mentioned it yesterday, yeah. there is a feeling in the, of, among the people that uh, Mr. Vikram Singh should be certainly be given a chance and I am of course of that view 
that uh, given the current political uh, 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 complexities of this country uh, in the sense that uh, other political leaders were also offered the PM ship, he was offered it and he took it. So, so, so given, given the background of UNP, I have to mention this for us. Yeah. Given the background of UN, UNP leadership in the, in, the, in the sense of, if you look at Lalit Atulat Mudali, Gamini Disanayaka, Ranasinghe Premadasa, they all were leaders who rose up to a challenge. Mm. You know, they stepped up when, the, when, when they were called upon and they were fearless. So, so I think in that spirit, Mr. Vikram Singh has also done that mm. and, and you can be a critic of him. Um, I certainly have been uh, critical, not, not the personality, but certain decisions he has made, I have been critical inside the party. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, think, I think he has shown leadership in, and in being courageous and taking this position. So let's, let's support him and see what he does. You know, um, here at News First, uh, we are proud to be uh, people first, and we are the people's channel, unashamedly so, and unapologetically so. But let me ask you this. This, the people, the people are suffering. The people are on the verge of starving. The Prime Minister has been up front and open and he said we may only be having two meals a day. Mm. You said actually we, there may be people having only one meal a day yeah. already. Yeah. So, now in the Sanaika, what should we be doing? There are 5.7 million families, households in the country. 2.7 million use gas. Three million are using Dara. And so perhaps this Dara business is only good for the Dara Mudalalis. Mm. But what about the people? How much more can they suffer? I think immediately for us, stop the queues. Get, yeah. the, get the gas, get the fuel uh, supplies, work out the logistics and do that. I think that can happen. Certainly, I've been privy to some conversations that have been happening. Uh, I think Prime Minister is on track to do that. And do we need a very small cabinet? And do we honestly need the presidency in, in such dire circumstances? Well, we need, a, we need a chairman and a CEO. If you, your company has a chairman and a CEO, right? Yes. Yeah, so, uh, so chairman and a CEO, you need it. You have so many companies under the Maharaja organization in each one has a capable CEO. Mm. So if you look at uh, Mr. Anil Vikram Singh as a CEO, mm. then he, has, he needs a board of directors. Will but un unfortunately for him, uh, he, can't, uh, he can't pick and choose his board of directors. Yeah. He can't pick and choose his chairman either. Mm. So, so he's basically the CEO. So we, and and let, us, let, us give, let us give him that leverage to move around and see whether he can get us out of this. Place. Last and final question. Do you think that Mr. Vikram Singh is willing or is he already some man's puppet and in this case I say again that the principal, the chief puppeteer must be Basil Rajapaksa. No, I think uh, we are beyond that uh, argument for us now. It's, it's very clear that uh, Basil's days are also numbered mm. and uh, you know he's trying his best to uh, scuttle the 21st amendment mm. but uh, I think there's overall consensus that the 21st amendment has to happen even within the Pohut tour. So this thing about, he was the, certainly the, the puppet master earlier, mm. but uh, I, I can tell you that, uh, that whatever uh, agreements on policy is between the chairman and the CEO, not, not with the puppet master, because puppet masters actually must be thrown out uh, for us because they have ruined this country. Mm. You know, these little manipulative operations they do through money and buying people, it has to come to a stop. So are you, are you for banning the crossovers business that's a very good thing because uh, this crossover business is also it's uh, it's actually dirty politics you know where you take money and you go um, you might do it for good intention but then uh, you're you're diluting the wish of the people because they they, they elect you for a purpose mm. and then you go to the other side maybe it's better to leave politics like Garmini Jayasurya Mm. You know, I mm. don't know whether you remember a person called Garmini Jayasurya. No, I... Uh, <coughs> he was the Minister of Agriculture mm. in the 1987 accord, when the accord was signed. Uh, he honorably resigned and he said he can't accept this uh, Indolanka accord and he resigned. And he left, he left politics. So that's, uh, that's I think, honorable politics. Um, 
Navin Disanayak, thank you very much uh, for being on Newsline Live. We really do appreciate thank you, it. Thank you so much. Upfront and you, open. Thank you, thank you so much. And let me finish off by uh, reading this message, which I received a few moments ago. Navin Disanayak, thank you for talking hard. I won't read the, the, uh, the rest of it because it might lead us into trouble. But, Navin Disanayak, thank you. Thank you so much for us. And it's an absolute pleasure. That's the way it was on Newsline Live. Thank you for watching. It's now time for the prime time news from the News First uh, team. And uh, I, I leave you, as always, by saying God bless you all.